Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for your word. Lord, you, we know that your word is truth. We know that the spirit is here to guide us into all truth, to change us into the image of Christ, Father. So we pray that you open our eyes and ears to hear, to hear what the word says to us, Lord, to apply it to our lives, to be a light to this world. Father, we just thank you for the freedom that we have in this country to come and worship you without persecution. May we not take that for granted, but to use it wisely. All the riches that we have and the freedoms that we have, Lord, help us to use them, not for our own selfish interests, Lord, but to bring about the kingdom, Father, to, to be a light to this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I entitled this Called, Commanded, and Committed. Are those things applicable to you today? There's a saying that you might think about. I don't know if you've heard it before or not, but God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And every Christian is called. You would not know God if He did not call you into His presence. Luke 6, verse 12 to 16, we'll be covering it today. One of those days, Jesus went out on the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him, and he chose twelve of them, whom he also designated apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So I'm going to do some word studies again today a little bit. First, do you know what the word disciple is in Greek? It's mathetaeus. Are you a disciple? If you ask that question to a lot of Christians, they would give you this strange look, or they might say no, but if you're not a disciple, you're not a Christian. Period. Jesus calls a person to die to themselves and come to Him and be trained up to present the gospel message to others. We call it the Great Commission. We know that we're supposed to love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, all our mind, and all of our strength, and then to love others as ourselves, a great commandment. We are supposed to be disciples of Jesus Christ, listening to His Word, being, tr tr being changed by the words that we hear, so that we can train up disciples to carry on that until Jesus Christ comes again. A mathetaeus is a student, a learner, or a pupil that commits and adheres to the teachings of their rabbi. The ultimate rabbi being the Messiah that would come, that was promised. The one that would save the people from their sins. And some of these disciples were disciples of John the Baptist before because he was out in the wilderness crying, making straight the path for the Lord to come, for the Messiah to come. And he was saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Which Jesus began his public ministry by saying also. But when they recognized that the Messiah had come, they became Jesus' disciples rather than John's disciples. They were committed to the Messiah, to His teachings, to be like Him, to give up their life, to be trained to live after Him and teach others to do the same. The word is used 269 times in the New Testament. The word Christians is used three times. 269 times a disciple, be it John's or be it Jesus, is used. And it's the understanding that you gave up your life, your patterns, your belief for the beliefs of someone else 
because they are greater than you. Their call is greater than you. Their call is greater than your life. You are committed and you adhere to the principles there. You, for principles there. You hear and obey. Luke has written the word three times so far and it's only come in controversy. It was when the Pharisees asked the disciples, why do you act this way? Why do you live this way? Why do you believe this? We see that you're different. We see that you follow Jesus and we don't agree with him. Why are you doing this? But they saw them differently than the world around them. And we're not just talking about the 12. We're talking about a bunch of disciples by this point. But as you read the scriptures, you'll also see that there's the crowds and then there's the religious. I use that term very liberally. And then there are those true ones that were disciples of Jesus Christ. If you're reading through John's disciple, though, you'll find gospel, you'll find at one point that in John chapter 6 that many of the disciples even turned back because this teaching was too hard for them. That Jesus is the bread of life. That the only way they're ever going to live is to consume Him. In Luke chapter 14, as we're advancing forward, you'll read, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, Jesus said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Those are our some tough teachings. That my relationship, and they get these, this scripture gets twisted too, but, but that my relationship with God, with Jesus, because he claims to be, he has the authority to forgive sins, he has the authority over nature and demons and everything else. He claims that he is the Lord of the Sabbath, the Son of Man that came, that he is God. And if you don't, your relationship with him is not right first, if it's not greater than the relationship with your wife, that you're with your brother, with your siblings, with your children, then you don't really have a relationship with him. He's not condoning that those relationships aren't good and you shouldn't have good relationships with him, but you can't love your spouse, you can't love your child more than you love God. Do you love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength? If you do that, then you will be able to love others. And if you can't love your brother, which you can see, how can you ever love God whom you cannot see? Is your relationship right with God? <clears throat> Such a person that does not love Jesus in that way, even more than their own life, if you're not willing to give up your time, your energy, your talents, everything else, your dreams, your desires for God's will and for His kingdom, then you cannot be my disciple. Such a person as one of these cannot be my disciple. And uh, put it on top of that, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So even if you give up all this, if, if, you, if you speak elegant words, if you have the gift of all prophecy and everything else, but you don't have love, you're just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, your life has no meaning or worth. Do you love God and love others more than you love yourself enough to lay down your life to save them because you carry the keys to the kingdom of heaven? You know the truth, but how do you live it? Are you then a disciple? A lot of Christians don't understand that they've been called by God to be a disciple or what that calling means what their gifts are, what the fruits of the Spirit are. They live their life as though Jesus sits over here and I'm all saved and I'm fine, but they don't live their life fixed on the, with their eyes fixed on Jesus as Lord of all. It's what really sets the, you apart from the rest of the crowd, doesn't it? Or from the religious Pharisees and hypocrites. Whether you're willing to give up your life for the one who gave up his life to save you. So the second word I want to mention is apostolos. It's a delegate or messenger sent forth with orders. Now, I've said it, and I'll say it again so you understand it. Every Christian, if that's a term we want to use, or every believer is a disciple. If you're not a disciple, you probably aren't a Christian or a true believer. Doesn't necessarily mean you're an apostle. 
especially an apostle with a capital A. Okay? You might consider yourself an apostle with a small a, but, but there is a big difference in Scripture here and how that's used. Because yes, every Christian is sent forth, but not necessarily sent forth outside of your workplace or your church or your neighborhood. The difference in the apostles with the capital A is these apostles carried the authority and the weight of Jesus. When they went out and said something, they were saying exactly what Jesus said. They were delegates. So maybe you can understand more when that guy brought his, that father brought his child to the church, to the apostles that were down, Peter and James and John were up on the mountain, and they brought, uh, he brought his child to be healed. They expected a healing. They had the authority and the power of what they said because they were following the rabbi. What they said was they were second in command right here. They were they're just as good as seeing Jesus because when Jesus was gone, they took up his banner and were like Jesus in this world and continued to train people up to be obedient to the gospel message, to study God's word, to be approved. So they had this authority in everything. But then there are other apostles. Stephen was apostle. You and I are apostles, especially if we're called to go somewhere else. But there's a difference in the meaning, especially attributed to the 12 apostles. In John chapter 12, we read, I have not spoken on my own, but, but the Father who sent has commanded me what, what to say and how to say it. And I know that his command leads to eternal life. So I speak exactly what the Father has told me to say. So the apostles, therefore, Matthew, um, Thaddeus, Judas, Judas Iscariot. The Judas first time I was talking about the other Judas. You know there are two, right? We'll talk about each there. there nobody names their child Judas anymore, does, do they? But there was a good Judas in there too. We, we forget about that. But they carried the weight and the authority of Jesus. People came to Judas Iscariot as a delegate, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I don't know what he was like before he, the Satan entered in him, Scripture says. I know he wrestled with the love of money, so that puts me one decision kind of from being Judas Iscariot or being Judas, the other Judas. Because we wrestle with these powers and principalities and this worldly flesh that, that desires and wages for our soul. But do you follow after Jesus? Do you realize then that you're a disciple? Because if you don't realize you're a disciple, you're not even following in the first place. And you're surely not doing the second part of that. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. This is what Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, which has kind of become the epicenter of, of uh, that area, Jerusalem uh, up in Asia Minor. And it says, he says it's built on the foundation of the apostles, those that have been sent out to that region to bring about the gospel message. Because just at the right time, Jesus Christ came when the Romans had conquered, so there was a language, not a language barrier that there was before. There was road systems and safety and everything else to, to bring about the gospel message being everywhere. And in Ephesus, there was this center that used to be for the pagan gods and still was, but the Christians were shining and growing. The light was stamping out the darkness. He says, you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles, New Testament, and prophets, Old Testament, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole build, building is fit together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you two are being built together into a dwelling place for God in his spirit. So do you know what the cornerstone is? Probably you, probably you guys aren't into architecture and building as much. But the cornerstone is the foundation stone that sets the direction of the building to make sure it's square, everything else. Then you have the foundation that's put upon that. If you don't know that, you would think, oh, Jesus is just the foundation. Jesus is the cornerstone with the teachings of the apostles that went out and the prophets of old because they had the Old Testament. It was, was their scriptures and all of that points to Jesus. This was the foundation. 
So if you don't have that pivotal cornerstone and you don't have a solid foundation, that, oh, let me say that 12 ordinary men, of which one was betrayed, but that was replaced later by Matthias, um, if you didn't have that foundation, if they didn't give up their life, take up their cross and follow after Jesus, the church would not be what it is today. If they would not have given up their lives because their lives meant nothing to them compared to you guys, which they did not even know yet, we would not have the solid foundation that we have. If those prophets of old would not have done that, and Hebrews says that many of them were sawn in half even for what they believed. They were stoned, they were persecuted, and their message was repent and turn to God before it's too late. So the cornerstone is pivotal, and so is the foundation. And then that scripture says, In him the whole building is fit together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together into a dwelling place for God in his spirit. So are you building? I mean, that's what you've got to come up with next. If I'm up here in this building and the structure is still being built and something is going to be built upon me here, then I'm pivotal again in this structure as it goes up for my children, my grandchildren, their grandchildren, their grandchildren, and so on and so forth until the day that Jesus Christ returns. So am I building? Kind of like, what's that? Is that Jenga or whatever where you pull out the things till it all topples? I think that's, is that the right game? You guys know games? Okay, I didn't know if it was or not. If that's not there, that tower starts to wobble and eventually it's going to fall. Are you building your life upon Jesus Christ? Ephesians chapter 4, Paul goes in a couple chapters later, says, So Christ Himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip His people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So we're pivotal in this building and we want to grow to maturity, not be tossed to and from because we can just drink milk and we're not studying God's Word and we don't know the meat of God's Word. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, we will be speaking the truth in love. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Himself who is the head that is Christ. From Him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting lim ligament grows and builds up in love as each heart does its work. So I am pivotal in this building that's continuing to go on until the church has reached its ful fulfillment and Jesus Christ returns and claims His church. But I have also got to grow and mature and build myself up in love as each part does its work. So I cannot not love my enemy. <laughs> I cannot not love my neighbor. I've got to love one another and it's built up in the things that I do expressed in how I live my life because I can say I love you and that doesn't mean that much. But if I show you how I love you by what I do for you, especially that I give up my time, my energy, my dreams, my desires to live for yours, especially when it comes to, to the gospel message, then I'm building up something. Do you understand what it means to be a disciple? What I read right there, disciple's not in it anywhere, but it's implying that we all are disciples. We all have our part. Christians not used there. Well, what does the Great Commission say? Matthew 28, you should know it pretty well. I, I, some of the times I always notice part that gets left out, but let's read it. Starting in verse 16 of Matthew 28. Then the 11 disciples, because we've lost one, because the devil's right there ready to sift us. We're, like I said, we're one, one choice away from being a Judas Iscariot rather than the other Judas then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. We still have that problem there. You still have that problem today. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. 
Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now you may not think you're a disciple yet, but this says that the twelve, for sure, and it calls them disciples here, not apostles, were to go make more disciples, to train them up to be doing exactly what they are doing. Hence, 2,000 years later, here we are as disciples of Jesus Christ. And we teach them, this is the part that I find that gets missed a lot, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Because so much part of discipleship now is let's teach them about Jesus and they get saved and then we really don't train them up much. Or if we do train them up much, we certainly don't want to get involved in those sticky situations where we need to come in and say, what you're doing is wrong but yet we're called to confess our sins to one another. We're called to t cut out any cancer that's in the body. We're called to be mature, to be like Christ in this world. And we're called to do it together. I can't do it without the arm of you and you and or the leg of you and, and like I said, the pancreas, whatever that does. It's, it's needed. It's helpful. I don't want to know what it's like living without it. Each has its has its part, and Paul even says the parts that are not as obvious, not as desirable, have very important roles in the body. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We don't know at what time that's going to come. Jesus said you don't need to know the times or seasons, but you do need to know this. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and at us that's conversion, you will be my disciples. You will go spread the word. You will be my witnesses to the world. You will be a light to the world. Did you know in that text that the disciple is not even in there in the original text? Now I'm confusing you. It just said the 11 disciples. I think it might be on that. that. But then when it says, therefore, and go make disciples of all nations, that word is not there for disciple. It's the verb part of it. It's go make disciples. It's matheteo. Because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to go and continually make disciples if we are in fact a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if you're not a disciple, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. It's not fit for you because you longingly look back at the world. So there's another word I want to mention. You know it well. You might not know it this way, but Christanos means Christian. It was first used, oh... 15 years roughly after Jesus left this world wasn't used before that it was used in a church in Antioch when news spread out that people in that area were living so radically different than the world around them that they had to get Barnabas to go visit Barnabas another apostle sent out by the twelve he had to go out and see what was going on here and report back to the elders in Jerusalem because they were so excited about this church. And it was in Antioch that they were first called Christians. He got so excited, he had to go get Saul, which we call Paul, to come see what's going on. Because here in Antioch, these guys were living like Christ. They were being persecuted for what they believed. It didn't matter. They were living like Christ in this world. They lived the way, the truth, and the life. The word's only used three times in Scripture also. Acts chapter 11 is the first place, starting in verse 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecutions that broke out when Stephen had been killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word um, uh, only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For, so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. 
Now, some of your commentaries and stuff will say that was a slang word for them. Maybe it was. Maybe it was a proud badge they wore. But it was in Antioch, period, how you do that, interpret that scripture, that they were first called Christians because they acted so radically different, so radically like Christ, even in persecution, that the world took note of it. <clears throat> they were living as Jesus taught, and they were called by a new name. Isaiah 62 begins this way, verse 1. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not remain quiet. Till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all the kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. They were first called Christians and they were not ashamed even unto death to be called like Christ or a follower of Christ or a little Christ, depending on how you interpret it. The word is used two other times. I told you that. It's used in Acts 26, verse 28, when Paul is giving his apology, apologia, his witness to, to the Agrippa, the king. And Agrippa says, Are you trying to turn me into a Christian so quickly? Yeah, Paul said, yeah, I, I, I am. I don't care if it comes now or later, but it's my goal that everyone, that's why I live the way that I do, that's why I'm in these chains, that's why I'm before you today and God's sovereign so that I will deliver this message to kings. That yes, I want you to know Jesus Christ and know the, the power of His salvation. It's used again in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. However, if you suffer as a Christian... Do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For, if, for it is time for judgment to begin with God's household, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Are you obeying the gospel? Are you a disciple? Are you carrying out your commission into this world? Are you a light? Are you shining? Are you going forth and telling? Are you writing about Jesus on your doorpost? When you get up, when you go about, when you get, go down to sleep, is that what you're doing? Or are you living your life the same way that you did before? Who is the king of your life? Who are you living for? Whose kingdom? A true Christian is a disciple of Christ. He has counted the cost. He is totally following and obeying Jesus and teaching that to others. You have been called. You have been commanded. But are you committed? You say you're called because you say, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian. You know you've been commanded because you read God's Word. You read that command many times about loving your enemies. Do you do it? Are you committed to following Jesus, taking up that cross, of shame, persecution, and possibly even death. Because living for the kingdom is worth more than what your life is worth because it was purchased. Are you willing to give your body? Are you willing to go to the de dry desert areas where the Spirit leads you or wherever it is that the Spirit takes you? Are you walking in step with the Spirit, producing fruit of the Spirit, using your gifts to build up the church and to make other Christian disciples even to the end of the age. Paul sums it up to the church in Galatia pretty clear. I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. <clears throat> it's not I that lives, but Christ who lives in, within me. The life I live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is that your desire? Is that a verse you can quote for yourself? As we're reading through Luke, you might have noticed some of the names that have been mentioned so far. Simon Peter was mentioned in chapter 4. It was at his mother-in-law's home that Jesus came in and, and cast out the sickness from her, and she began to serve. And then all night long people came to him. We read about James and John, that they were Simon Peter's fishing partners in chapter 5. And then we read about Levi or Matthew later in chapter 5. And when Jesus called him, we don't know anything prior to that. He wasn't a fisherman or anything. We know that he had basically sold his soul to the devil for money, gave up his heritage, everything else. 
And when Jesus called him, he immediately left his tax collector's booth behind and threw a party for Jesus with the rest of his scumbag friends as the world saw it. But the reason he did is he was so overjoyed that he wasn't going to look back at the riches of this world. He wasn't going to look forward at what could happen to him. He was going to look at the here and now and he could tell the rest of his friends, even though they might have been of low estate as far as the world, because Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. He said, let's have a party so that you can know who this man is that has the authority to forgive sins. You've heard about all the things he's done, but now I'm inviting you to come in and eat with Jesus himself. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now we're to Luke chapter 6, verse 12. One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. How many times in your life have you spent all night because of the urgency of what was facing you to pray? I spent hours I haven't spent all night, and I, I'm, I'll give my, my own uh, things here instead of pointing fingers at anybody else. You know, when that urgency is more, that prayer life seems to be a little stronger. When that urgency is not as much, that prayer life doesn't seem to be quite as strong. Jesus was committed to doing the Father's will. He was a rock star, so to speak, by now, and his life was in danger every single day. And the the demand of the people on him, the crowds were in the thousands. We know that because he fed 5,000 men coming up. There was so much pressure on Jesus. I cannot imagine that. That one of the reasons he appointed these apostles and what he had to pray for was he appointed 12 men, knowing one was going to betray him, but he had to go to the Father with prayer to choose the right men for this task. This was a tremendous t task. I cannot fathom being called for it because I'm pretty sure I would fail at it. I don't know how you feel, but I mean, he asked those men, and we know that Peter had a wife, you know, because we, we know the mother-in-law. Probably had children. I, I don't know. But he said, I'm going to give it all. I understand that, not even having that scripture read to him yet, what it means to have a relationship with Jesus is more powerful than any other human relationship I can have. And in fact, if I have that, then that means I can spread his love out so hopefully they do become saved. They do know saving knowledge because I can't save them, but I can be prayerfully dependent. I can live my life for God's glory and honor so that hopefully they will see the ark that I'm building and enter in. Condemn the world. And it cost these guys, it cost all of them their life. We'll go over that briefly in a little bit. But Jesus spent all night, he was prayerfully dependent on seeking God's will and not getting distracted or anything else. So what about you? What about me? Do you realize that we've been called? Are we following Jesus' commands? Are you fully committed and are you praying about it because you definitely can't do it on your own. Oh yeah, fully committed to following Jesus, denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following after Him, and making disciples. So if you fail at your calling, it's like one of those guys that, that might have failed, who is not going to hear the gospel message as a result? Who has God put in your path for you to be a light and a witness to? that if you fall short of that because you're chasing after your own dreams and desires, they won't get to hear the gospel message from you anyway. Verse 13, when morning came, so he, all night long he's tired everything else, he called his disciples to him, not the twelve, he called seventy, we know at least, eighty, a hundred, five hundred, whatever number that he called to him. And he chose twelve of them who he designated as apostles, and I gave you that definition. And here's the name, Simon, whom he called Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. If you read the other accounts, it names the twelve. In Matthew chapter 10, it says, Jesus gave them authority over unclean spirits so they could drive them out and heal every disease and sickness. That's why it was so 
important for you to realize that, that that man that brought his son to, G, to the apostles wanted his, the demon cast out of his son and expected that to be done. But they didn't. And why did Jesus say when they gathered together privately afterwards, why did Jesus say that they couldn't do it? Because they didn't pray enough. That's what he told them. In Mark chapter 3, verse 14, he did this to accompany him to be sent out to preach. They went out in front of him in the lands, prepping for his arrival and so forth. And verse 15, to have authority to drive out demons. So they're like John, spreading the way, clearing the way for Jesus, making the path straight. Twelve ordinary men. How much do we know about a lot of them? Not a lot. Scripture doesn't tell us a lot about most. I mean, we know about the key figures, so we think. And as you're reading along, you, you think James is going to be real key in, the, in it, and then he is slain by a sword right off. What? Is God not in control? Is He not going to build His kingdom? Of course He is. John lives on to a ripe old age, but not because he wasn't persecuted. If you know the history of him, he was boiled in oil, his skin was burnt off, but he got up and ran away. <laughs> Because it wasn't his time to die. Didn't mean they didn't try. Twelve less than ordinary men, if you think about it. Not twelve ordinary men, but less than ordinary. Look at the problems that Peter had. Simon was a zealot. Jude, uh, Matthew was a tax collector. Oh, twelve to go out to the twelve tribes of Israel, which would reject Jesus as a whole so that he would take the gospel message out further and use the Stephens and the Philips and the Barnabases and the Pauls as well as the twelve disciples because they all left uh, Israel and went out and went out to different parts of the world in direct opposition of the false teachers of Israel who would not repent woe to them woe to them because they did not know the meaning of God desires mercy not sacrifice and that Jesus has not come to call the righteous but sinners. In Matthew, the twelve are sent out next to deliver the good news or judgment depending on what, they, what the people choose. In Mark, the next thing written after this is that Jesus' own family thought He was out of His mind. Crazy. Yeah, we see the miracles that He does, but no, He can't be God. His own family... Jesus, and they, they even said he was possessed by Beelzebub. Jesus answered, if a kingdom is divided against itself, it cannot stand. So is your kingdoms divided or have you pledged allegiance to Jesus and only Jesus? And all the, the lists of the twelve, the lists are the same, but you do see them divided into groups of four each time. So Peter was probably the leader of the four, of uh, James and John and Andrew. I always think Andrew gets a bad rap because <laughs> he doesn't get mentioned with us. He didn't get up on the mountain and stuff. But every time you read about Andrew, he is bringing someone else to Jesus, even a little boy with just his lunch and saying, I don't know what you can do with this, Jesus, but here he is. Wow. If you study about him, he went to a lot of places too. That's why he's the patron saint of so many places is Andrew. He probably didn't worry about any type of fame whatsoever. He just worried about bringing people to Jesus. So let's look at him a little bit briefly. Simon, we also know as Peter, right? He was a fisherman, right? His brother is the one who was a disciple before him because he brought him to Jesus, remember? <clears throat> just kind of like Barnabas trained uh, Paul, and then you don't read about Barnabas anymore. He was always bringing someone to Jesus. Peter didn't look like the person that we would see that would lead the church. He looked like one that was destined for failure. But we know what he did at Pentecost. He got up boldly, and if you look at the sermon that he preached, it was Jesus is the one. We know it by the miracles that he did. He came, he died, and he will return again. What do we need to do? Because they're quickened by the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized. Repent so that you believe these teachings now, that you train yourself up to be a disciple. So Cephas, another name, but was Peter was a stone. He traveled to Asia Minor. Later he was crucified upside down, is what tradition has, at Circus Maximus for his faith. And we have First and Second Peter in our New Testament as a result of him. 
I told you that about his brother Andrew. He brought Peter to Jesus. His name means manly. I like Andrew. I'll say it again. His name meant manly. That's a man. He doesn't worry about himself. He worries about others, which Scripture says in about bringing them to Jesus. He evangelized to Turkey and Greece. He was crucified on an X-shaped cross in A.D. 70. He, did, he was tied to it and suffered over three days and then died. And tradition has that he said the whole time that he praised God for being worthy of being crucified. Wow. James... Another fisherman, son of Zebedee, sons of thunder. We, it's strange there, and you go with this wherever, you know that you know his dad's name, you know his wife's, the, his mother's name too. Do you know her name? Have you figured it out from Scripture? Salome, one of the women at the, at the uh, tomb. They were known as sons of thunder. He said James seemed to be the second in command, but was the first disciple or first apostle to be martyred. Remember Stephen was martyred before that for giving out bread to feed the poor. Don't get James confused with James the leader that became the leader of the church because that was Jesus' half-brother who one of those that said he's out of his mind. But then he saw a a crucified Jesus risen again and he got some clarity. John was a fisherman, probably the youngest, the, the younger son of thunder. the only disciple not to be martyred, and it wasn't for lack of trying, like I said. We have the fact that he was boiled, but also tradition says that he was given poison to drink, and it didn't do nothing to him. Because <laughs> you're not going to die before God calls at your time. The thing is, are you willing to die for God when he does call the time? We're all going to die. I think I'd much rather be willing to die for God than just die. He became known as the Apostle of Love, and we have five books of the New Testament written by him. This is that first group of four which seemed to be the inner circle. But like I said, you don't hear as much about Andrew in it. That's probably because y'all guys go up on the mountain. I don't know what's going to happen here, but this guy over here I'm going to bring back to meet Jesus. I'll be here when you get back. That's kind of how I like to look at it again. Then you've got Philip, not to be confused with the Philip of Acts, of course. He's from the same town as as Peter, so he could be a fisherman. Probably at least since Jesus' ministry was in the Galilean area, he was a man of a craft or a trade, not not anybody educated or wise or anything. Philip brought Nathaniel or Bartholomew to Jesus. You'll find that in John chapter 1, verse 45. He says, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, the one... The apostles foretold Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. In John chapter 6, he is the one that stated, where in the world could we get enough money to buy uh, food for all these people on the mountainside? And I reminded you that Andrew said, well, here's a boy with his lunch. Do what you will with it, Jesus. Bartholomew, or Nathaniel in John's gospel, he was from Cana of Galilee. So maybe he was a fisherman also. We don't know. Nathaniel asked, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Jesus said he was an Israelite in whom there was no guile or deceit. John chapter 1 verse 49, uh, he said, You are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. What a statement. He went to Armenia and he had his skin whipped off of him and was crucified in AD 70 as tradition has it. Most of this we get from tradition. Now Matthew has some of this order reversed and so does Mark but they still have them grouped together like I said Matthew um, he gave up his birthright like I said for money for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil but he left everything to follow Jesus and we have his gospel to thank he evangelized Ethiopia and was beheaded in AD 60 Then there's Thomas, or the twin, Didymus, which means twofold. He was a twin. We know that. His order is reversed in the the, uh, list in Matthew. He gets a bad reputation all the time because he's known as a doubter, doubting Thomas, because he's the one that says, unless I believe. But remember, he wasn't there the first day Jesus returned. So you got all these guys telling him that Jesus returned, and he says, I'm not going to believe unless I touch. Did that mean he doubted? He wasn't there. We, we want to give him a bad rap for that. But remember also, when Lazarus died, he was the one that said, hey, when all of them said, if we go there, Lord, you're going to be killed. And he was the one that said, 
let's all go and die with him. Did he mean that sarcastically? If you think of him as a doubter, you might think that, but if you think of him as not a doubter, just someone who wanted some proof, someone that was in mourning about the Lord because all, uh, he loved Jesus so much that he said, no, unless I, I see and touch, if you don't think he was a doubter, then you think he was one that wanted to go with Jesus. It all depends on how you look at him. We don't know. But he never wavered after that. And if you look at his reply when he saw Jesus... Whether he touched him or not, we don't know from Scripture again. Here was his reply, My Lord and my God. Wow. That's the strongest quote of any of the, the apostles that we have whatsoever. My Lord and my God. Equating him, take his, uh, his roots where he came from again. The Lord, the God of Israel. And you are that, Jesus, and you are my God. I will worship you. I will live my life for you. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have, have not seen and yet have believed. Was he a doubter? I doubt it. That's just what I say. So is Jesus your Lord and your God? Will you lay down your life for him? Tradition has he went to India and was killed by a spear. Then you have James the son of Alphaeus, or James the Less. Maybe he was younger, maybe it was stature, what didn't have anything to do with importance. His mother was probably one of the Marys that were at the tomb. He went to Syria and was martyred in AD 63 because he was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple, as tradition has it. Remember the pinnacle of the temples where Jesus took, or where the devil took Jesus and said, All these kingdoms can be yours? And ironically, they threw him off of there. Uh, we're talking hundreds of feet. I don't know what the exact thing is. Do you know at all? We're talking about a great distance, and he didn't die. <laughs> so tradition has. So then they took a big boulder and smashed his head. All because they proclaimed Jesus Christ, because they live like Jesus Christ in this world. Then you have Simon the Zealot. It says he's a Canaanite. Don't get that confused. That means that he was zealous. He was zealous for political revolution, and a lot of them carried daggers around, so when they found a Roman out by himself, they could kill him to bring about the overthrow of the Roman Empire. Wow, it's a miracle he didn't kill Matthew the tax collector. Right? I mean, these are the group, the motley crew that, that, God, that Jesus called together after praying all night that God revealed to him. Uh, he went to North Africa, Spain, and Britain, until he, legend has he was sown in half. Oh, that reminds me of Hebrews chapter 11. They were stoned. They were sown in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went around in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and hid in caves and holes in the ground. This is referring to the Old Testament, of course, but the pattern is exactly the same for the New Testament saints. What's happened? Is it because we sit in our easy chair too much that... We don't have this today. It happens in other countries, guys. They die for their faith all the time. I'm not saying that's wrong, but what I am saying is are you living for Jesus Christ in the freedom that you have today? Or do you not realize that you're a disciple and you're living for your own desires instead of for the Great Commission? These were all commended for their faith, yet they did not receive what was promised. God had planned something better for us so that together with us they would be made perfect. Judas, the son of James, Labaius, or Thaddeus are the different names. Or Jude. Labaius means man of heart. Thaddeus means large-hearted and courageous. Not to be mistaken with, with the half-brother of Jesus, Jude. But this is the other Judas that you don't hear hardly anything about. But he is in Scripture in John chapter 14. It says, Judas, not a scary, to ask him, Lord, <coughs> why are you going to reveal yourself to us <coughs> and not to the world? I think this is very, very pivotal. And that's why I've asked you which Judas you're going to be because it's the point I'm going to get to here. But the only thing we have from Scripture is, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Do you ask yourself that? I mean, you're one Judas or the other. You live your life living for your own desires, and maybe one day it'll cost you your soul. Or you live for the kingdom because you realize that you've been bought, you've been purchased, you cannot pay your sin debt. You are 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. Which one are you? Because you should ask yourself the question, why did you reveal yourself to me? Why am I called? What, is it, what am I commanded to do? Am I committed to doing it? Because I'm part of this building. I'm a stone in it. And there are people that will be built upon mine and, and everyone's work will be judged. Jesus' reply to him was, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. The words that you hear is not my own, but it is from the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, from whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give it to the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. <clears throat> Tradition says that Jude or Thaddeus was shot with arrows, clubbed or axed to death. We're not really sure. But he was killed for his faith without a doubt. And without a doubt, he died in peace. Without a doubt, he knew why Jesus revealed himself to him. And he became an apostle sent to wherever the Holy Spirit led him. That's unlike Judas Iscariot, the traitor. And I said before, no one, you don't see the name Judas anymore. We sell to so many people on eBay. And I've noticed this. There are more J names than any name that's out there. Don't know why, but I can show you on any given thing. I go right now and tell you that 27 of the 100 names or whatever begin with, with a J. I have yet to see a Judas. <laughs> I'm sure there are some out there. I just What I have noticed, but uh, you just don't name yourself Judas anymore because it means something bad still to this day. The one that sold himself out to the devil for his love of money and then regretted it but didn't repent and turn to God. Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Revelation 21, 14, The wall of the city had twelve foundations bearing the name of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. They gave up everything in this world, and Jesus told them that they would be rewarded a hundredfold in this world, and then eternal life. It's hard to see how they were rewarded a hundredfold in this world. But it's not if you look at that foundation that they were building. Because that got built upon, and that got built upon, and that got built upon. Oh, there's at least a hundredfold. And then there's eternal life. And they will be honored forever. You will see their names for the fact that they gave up this world and followed after, after the Lamb. They were the apostles of the Lamb. Matthew 7, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them like a wise man who built his house on the rock, the rain fell, the torrents raged, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because its foundations <coughs> was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains fell, the torrents raged, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and the great was its collapse. Paul also writes to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10, by the grace God has given us, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one of you must, build, must be careful on how he builds, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. If anyone builds on the foundation using gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, no matter what you use, his workmanship will be evident, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will prove the quality of each man's work. So I ask you, which Judas are you more like? Do you realize that you're a disciple, that you've been called by God, that He has commanded you to be obedient to His Word, to train up disciples to be obedient to His Word? Are you fully committed to that calling? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are worthy of our glory, our praise, and our honor. We thank you that Jesus was committed not only to the cross, but to living a prayerful, dependent life as a human being 
relying on the help of other ordinary human beings to help him carry out this gospel, this good news of salvation, that God is reconciling mankind to himself, no longer holding their sins against them. Oh, Father, we thank you and praise you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. They are new every day. We thank you for the love that you have given, the, the grace that you've given us, for the words that you have revealed to us when you have called us. Lord, may we study your word to grow and to, to be good workmen that rightly handle the word of truth. May we love you with all of our hearts so that our love overflows to others. Father, forgive us for our sins when we fall short. Help us to confess our sins to each other, Lord. And we know that we have an advocate who is faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To you be all glory and honor through the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Sherry just looked at me, Debbie, but she's still outside. So, you know what's next? You want me to go get her? <laughs> <laughs>